fresh-faced politician, an adorable statesman, an athletic world leader, a fashion icon, and a ladies' man. We get it. This man is the political equivalent of a Disney prince. But the kind of media attention his hair locks and chisel jawline evoke leaves one wondering if the media is so smitten by his never-ending photo ops that they can't seem to objectively analyze his actions in office. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay and I'm here to talk to you about Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, a leader who's high on style, not so much on substance. Mr. Trudeau regularly breaks the internet with images of him cuddling pandas, hugging refugees, playing ice hockey and getting accidentally photographed in the wild with his shirt off, not once, but twice. Not a day goes by when Justin Trudeau does not feed the news cycle with a new shareable moment. Now do me a favor, do a Google News search for Trudeau and compare stories in the Canadian media with international articles that focus solely on his personality and looks. In fact, let me save you the effort. This is how most of the international media covers this leader. Reasons why the world is obsessed with Justin Trudeau. We need to talk about this picture of Justin Trudeau, the meaning of Justin Trudeau's tattoo, and this, let Justin Trudeau in his pajamas brighten your Monday. It's as if we are being forced to turn a blind eye to his policies by looking at his handsome smile and pajamas. So let me show you how the Canadian media covers their Prime Minister. Just some headlines from the past few months. Trudeau has failed the moral test of leadership. Trudeau drops into another pitfall of his own making. Trudeau's troubling climate evangelism and how the Trudeau government is failing the world's most vulnerable despite its feminist aid policy. The point I'm making is simple. There's less to this leader than meets the eye. His global image is largely the product of people's fascination with the novelty of his personal brand. But in reality, the gap between his words and actions is too big to cork. We're taking action at our borders through investments in the CBSA, RCMP and other law enforcement branches, we're taking aim at traffickers and stopping the illegal trafficking of guns from coming into our country. And indeed, in 2021, just last year, the CBSA had a record year for illegal gun seizures. Assault weapons like AR-15s serve just one purpose, and that's to kill innocent people. They don't belong in Canada, which is why we banned them two years ago. Our rules ensure that any new firearms meeting the criteria are automatically prohibited, even if they aren't explicitly listed in the regulations, meaning there are no loopholes. In fact, the original list of 1,500 banned uh, AR-15 and assault-style firearms has now ground, grown to over 1,800 as new firearms are meeting the criteria and thus being banned from Canada. Hi, I'm Kerry Bryant. Since last September 1st, I am the Alberta Chief Firearms Officer. I have uh, just recently written a letter to the uh, Federal Minister of uh, public safety, the Honorable Marco Mendocino, uh, in which I indicated that uh, I called on him to uh, withdraw the order in council, which was passed in uh, or implemented in May, uh, banning over 1,500 types of modern and traditional military uh, and uh, modern, uh, modern and traditional sporting firearms and many other military artifacts, uh, historical treasures. And uh, I called on him to either drop that prohibition altogether, or if he can't drop it altogether, to at least allow provinces to opt out. The reasoning behind this is something that I think can appeal to both gun owners and non-gun owners alike. Gun owners, of course, understand that this is uh, a meaningless waste of money. Uh, it's probably going to cost billions of dollars. It will be another multi-billion dollar boondoggle, just like the long gun registry. 
and uh, they understand that, in, in essence, there's nothing wrong with these guns. There's no evidence that has been uh, brought forward to show that these guns are anything that represents a danger to uh, the Canadian public when they're in the hands of properly vetted uh, legal Canadian gun owners. Finally, we will soon implement a mandatory buyback program to get these weapons of war off of our streets for good. Now is not the time for politicians to exploit fears and to pit people one against the other. For non-gun owners, I think the cost issue is going to be really the big thing. Uh, as we saw with the long gun boondoggle, when uh, government says something's going to cost one amount, it often costs a vastly larger amount, particularly once all the administration costs are brought in. And those administration costs are not just dollars. Those are actually, that's actually going to be the time of law enforcement personnel, for example, who will be diverted from pursuing criminals onto these meaningless administrative tasks like processing uh, confiscations and compensations uh, under this program. So for the non-gun owning public, I think it's really important that they understand how much this is going to cost, how many precious resources it's going to take away, and how many better uses there are for those resources. We should instead be spending that money to hire more border officers so that we can stop guns coming in illegally across the border. We need to hire more firearms officers so we can do a, a more com a complete and timely job in processing PAL applications and ensuring that uh, people are properly screened. We need to hire more uh, police officers, particularly in guns and gangs units. A lot of these units uh, are, they do great work, but they're underfunded, they need more resources, and they need stable resources over the long term. And then finally, uh, we need to not only look at uh, the after the criminal acts have been committed, we need to look at preventing them from happening in the first place by having more social workers to keep people out of gangs, drug addiction counselors to get people off drugs, because it's a drug trade that fuels a lot of this uh, criminal trade in guns and the violence that is racking Canadian streets. ...hundred models of assault-style weapons, including the Ruger Mini-14 used at Polytechnic and the AR-15. We also expanded background checks to keep firearms out of the wrong hands. We did it because it was what responsible leadership required us to do. That's not responsible leadership. He also loves to play dress up. How many of you remember his visit to India? His fashion diplomacy made quite the headlines. While some said that his wardrobe choices were a bit too much, choices like these, a golden Sherwani, he looked more Bollywood than Bollywood actors themselves. We don't dress up like this every day, Mr. Trudeau, not even in Bollywood. That's not responsible leadership. That's not responsible leadership. Justin Trudeau likes to project himself as a champion of equality, but time and again, his carefully cultivated image of the poster boy liberal has been called into serious question by pictures and images like these. This is the righteous Mr. Trudeau dressed up as Aladdin in a turban and robes and brown face makeup at a party in 2001. And this is again the virtuous Mr. Trudeau wearing black face makeup and an Afro wig, apparently singing a Jamaican song. This one's from his school yearbook. What did Justin Trudeau have to say about these images? No prizes for guessing. I didn't see that from the layers of privilege that I have. So uh, even though we've moved forward in significant ways as a government, uh, what I did, the choices I made, 
uh, hurt people, hurt people who thought I was an ally. Uh, I am an ally, but this uh, is something that obviously uh, I deeply regret and I never should have done. If I had a dollar for every time Justin Trudeau apologized, I'd be swimming in cash. Is not responsible leadership. Nobody forced me to join the military. I was prepared to be killed in action. What I wasn't prepared for, Mr. Prime Minister, is Canada turning its back on me. First of all, uh, why are we still uh, fighting against certain uh, veterans groups in court? Uh, because uh, they are asking for more than we are able to give right now. Is not responsible leadership. Member of this house and a descendant of Holocaust survivors, and I have never made to, I've, it's never been singled out, and I have never been made to feel less, except for today when the Prime Minister accused me of standing with swastikas. I think he owes me an apology. I'd like an apology, and I think he owes an apology to all members of this house. Is not responsible leadership. Trudeau also likes to position himself as a proud feminist. He says he has no tolerance for sexual harassment. In August 2000, a female reporter accused him of having groped her at a music festival. Trudeau apparently apologized. The controversy died down. In 2018, three years after he became the Prime Minister of Canada, it resurfaced. Trudeau was questioned about this incident and his apology. And this is what he had to say. If I uh, apologized later, then it would be because I sensed that she was not entirely comfortable with the interaction we had. I apologized uh, in the moment. Uh, I certainly feel that, that uh, uh, if, uh, um, again, I, I don't want to speak for her. I don't want to presume how she feels now. Is not responsible leadership. And this is not the end of our Trudeau story. The Canadian Prime Minister also loves to wade into the internal affairs of other countries. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here. Justin Trudeau tried to lecture India on the farmer protests. He tried to play the spokesperson for the protesters. Did the farmers ask him to do this? No, they did not. Did he help their cause with his statements? No, he did not. Nonetheless, Trudeau has been going on and on about fundamental rights. He says he will always stand up for the right to peaceful protest. Canada will always be there to defend the right of peaceful protest. We believe in the importance of dialogue and that's why we've reached out uh, through multiple means directly to uh, the Indian authorities. And last week, thousands of Canadian truckers reached their limit. A convoy of truckers converged on the capital city, Ottawa, to demand peacefully, cheerfully, but persistently an end to Justin Trudeau's tyranny. Justin Trudeau's response to this display of democracy, he fled the city. Trudeau evacuated his official residence and hid in an undisclosed location. He is still cowering there tonight. When Canadian citizens protested, Trudeau asked them to respect the rule of law. When Indian farmers protested, Trudeau turned it into an issue of human rights. Irony would have shot itself and died a thousand deaths. And just in case you still think that he's fighting for the farmers of India, then let me ask you a question. What exactly do these farmers want? They want legal provisions to ensure MSP, minimum support price. What has Canada done vis-a-vis -vis these demands? For years, Canada has challenged this very MSP and the World Trade Organization. Canada slammed the government of India for giving farm subsidies. In other words, Justin Trudeau, who claims to support India's farmers, has challenged the Indian government's farmer-friendly policies at the World Trade Organization then what explains his activism over the farmer protest? One word, politics. He tried to use India's farmer protests for his own selfish interests. He's catering to the sentiments of Canada's powerful Sikh community that has become a huge voting bloc. He is pleasing the 18 Sikh MPs in Canada, four of whom are part of his cabinet. Is not 
responsible leadership. And it's not the only thing that's collapsing. The Canadian economy is in deep trouble. One in five Canadians now report going hungry because of inflation. Thankfully, they've got Justin Trudeau on the scene, and he's got a plan. He announced just the other day he's going to deal with Canada's biggest problem, and that, of course, is two-spirit Eskimos. They're facing a lot of discrimination. And to rectify that, Trudeau announced that Canada will invest $100 million in a, quote, historic action plan for something called, and we're quoting, the 2SLGBTQI plus communities. Those communities are hurting, not that Justin Trudeau can identify who they are exactly. Here's part of his announcement. Since day one, our government has been committed to protecting the rights of two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and additional sexuality and gender diverse people. Remember when liberals used to say, we don't care about your sex lives, we don't care who you sleep with. You kind of never imagined when they were saying that, that they'd be awarding tax dollars to people on the basis of who they sleep with. Really? We should also note that Justin Trudeau spelled out all of those words. The acronym LGBTQ plus has given him some trouble before because like everyone else on planet Earth, he has no freaking idea what it means. Here he was in September. I will never apologize for standing up for an LGDP, uh, LGT, LBG, LGBT. LGBTQ2 plus uh, kids' rights. <laughs> you can imagine him practicing in the mirror. But no one told him what the letters stand for because, again, nobody knows. And the acronym has since grown. It's now 2SLGBTQI+. And if you don't know it, you're a bigot because they're getting $100 million for some reason, even though we can't identify them and no one knows what a two-spirit is, but shut up. How much of that money is coming from the truckers whose bank accounts Trudeau seized? <laughs> is not responsible leadership. Here, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we all know that the rules of the House do not permit us to eat in this place. Uh, and I can't help but observing that during the last vote, uh, a number of people were uh, eating uh, in their seats, uh, including the Minister of Defence, the Minister of Canadian Heritage, and the Prime Minister, who appeared to be hiding a bagel in his desk. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is already staying in this place with corruption. He does not need to stay with mustard as well. Exactly. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. It was a chocolate bar, but I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I'll remember for last is not responsible leadership. After discussing with cabinet and caucus, after consultation with premiers from all provinces and territories, after speaking with opposition leaders, the federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act to supplement provincial and territorial capacity to address the blockades and occupations. I want to be very clear. The scope of these measures will be time-limited, geographically targeted, as well as reasonable and proportionate to the threats they are meant to address. The Emergencies Act will be used to strengthen and support law enforcement agencies at all levels across the country. This is about keeping Canadians safe, protecting people's jobs, and restoring confidence in our institutions. These tools include strengthening their ability to impose fines or imprisonment. The government will designate secure and protect places and infrastructure that are critical to our economy and people's jobs, including border crossings and airports. We cannot and will not allow illegal and dangerous activities to continue.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it uh, gives me great uh, honour and privilege to be speaking on Bill C-71, and at the outset I'd like to be saying that I will be sharing my time with the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's an establishment in my riding, which is in the middle of Toronto, a great family establishment called uh, Playtime Bowling. And it's a place where um, mothers and fathers can take their, their children, their loved ones, to kick back at the end of a busy week where they can um, distract themselves with a, a little bit of close time with, uh, with the ones that they care for, the ones that they work for every day. Um, I take my girls there, um, like many families do in my community. And the reason why I'm referring to this establishment at the outset of my remarks is a little less than two weeks ago, um, on a weekend night, uh, shots rang out. And shortly after those shots rang out, uh, two people's lives were lost. This is part of a, a disturbing trend which we've seen um, not only in my community, uh, not only in the City of Toronto or the GTA, uh, but right across uh, the country. And, um, in Toronto, there were 61 homicides in 2017, uh, many of which were associated with some form of gun violence. In 2018, there have been 28 shootings, shooting incidents already reported. Uh, this number is up 55% from this point. Uh, in time last year. And I want to say that uh, this is in spite of the, the great efforts of local uh, police officers with Toronto Police Services uh, and uh, with many actors within the law enforcement. But the reality is that gun violence is all too common um, in many neighbourhoods, not only in Eglinton Lawrence, uh, but right across the country. Bill C-5 addresses systemic racism and discrimination in the criminal justice system by promoting a fairer and more effective justice system that, among other things, will provide courts with increased judicial discretion at sentencing through the elimination of some mandatory minimum penalties of imprisonments and restrictions on the imposition of conditional sentences of imprisonment. The small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing do not represent the views of Canadians who have been there for each other, who know that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. But even after all this has ended, Conservative MPs still can't pick a lane. Canadians want to know, do they stand with blockaders or do they stand with Canadian communities? Canadians at home? Watching in disgust and disbelief at this behaviour, wondering how this could have happened in our nation's capital after everything we've been through together. This is not the story of our pandemic, of our country, of our people. Canada is strong because you are strong. Police were clear that they needed tools not held by any federal, provincial or territorial law. It was only after we got advice from law enforcement that we invoked the Emergencies Act. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, did yourself or anyone in the OPS request the invocation of the Emergency Act? I did not make that request. I'm not aware of anybody else in the Auto Police Service who did. We invoked the Emergencies Act after we received advice from law enforcement. The advice we received was to invoke the Emergencies Act. The Trudeau government caught lying again about the Emergencies Act. Hi, I'm Brian Lilly, political columnist with the Toronto Sun. We've heard that.
claim from Marco Mendicino, the public safety minister, time and time again, they only brought in the Emergencies Act because, well, the police asked for it. It was at the request of the police. After consulting with the police, check out this compilation from Cosman over at the True North Centre. Look, I, I don't want to speak uh, for every last serving member uh, of, of law enforcement, but there was a very strong consensus that we needed to invoke the act. We invoked the act because it was the advice of nonpartisan professional law enforcement. The advice that we were getting was that um, that law enforcement needed the Emergencies Act. It was only after we got advice from law enforcement that we invoked the Emergencies Act. And that advice came from very experienced law enforcement. We had to invoke the Emergencies Act, and we did so on the basis of non-partisan professional advice from law enforcement. And that was the advice that we were receiving from law enforcement, and one of the main reasons why we invoked the Emergencies Act. We got the advice from uh, our law enforcement that we'd met the threshold. They then came to their judgment, as you say, and thereafter, uh, we came to ours on the basis of the advice that we were getting from law enforcement. Of course, since those claims were made, we found out that they're not true at all. The RCMP commissioner clearly stated in committee yesterday that the RCMP didn't request that the act be invoked and that police used existing legislation to resolve border blockades. Brenda Lucky, the commissioner of the RCMP, appeared before a Commons committee investigating the use of the Emergencies Act and said her department never asked for it. The former chief of the Ottawa police, Peter Slowly, said he never asked for it. And acting police chief Steve Bell, who replaced him, said the same thing. Now Mendicino's department is saying, look, you know, he's just been misunderstood. No, he's not been misunderstood. Like so many issues surrounding the use of the Emergencies Act, he's been caught lying. Now, that's unparliamentary language, but thankfully for Minister Mendicino, I'm not in Parliament. But he is not telling the truth. He has fibbed. He has lied. He has changed and altered his story more than once. They invoked the Emergencies Act because it was politically popular. But it wasn't needed to clear out the protests, the convoy in Ottawa. What was needed was for the local police service, Ottawa police, the people in charge, to do their jobs. And once Peter Slowly was fired, once Steve Bell took over and regular police tactics were used instead of progressive policing, the streets were cleared. That's all that it took. And that's why they invoked the Emergencies Act. That's why they suspended civil liberties, which they have claimed they did not do. And that is why they continue to change their story and not tell the truth to the Canadian public. We've got an inquiry into the use of this act, but if it continues along the lines of how the Trudeau government has been answering basic questions from MPs and journalists, don't expect much truth to come out of that inquiry. Emergency. So, Mr. Speaker, when did the Prime Minister lose his way? When did it happen? You right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker... Conservative Party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. We will choose to stand with Canadians who deserve to be able to get to their jobs, who be able to get their lives back. These illegal protests need to stop, and they will, Mr. Speaker. Justin Trudeau is an evil, soulless lizard person. There is nothing real about that cardboard cutout of a human being. She's using his words against him. Now, she happens to be Jewish. From what I understand, she lost uh, family members in the Holocaust, okay? And then he dares say that, oh, you stand with people who wave swastikas and, and stand for the Confederate flag, which, by the way, where are all the videos on that? Can we get some of them? I'll play them. Phoenix, I want you to do a dive tomorrow like you've never done before. I want every single swastika, every single Confederate flag, every single mean sign. The targets racialized people because of systemic discrimination or sends people to prison because they struggle with addiction. This bill is another step forward to create a system that is fair, effective, and keeps Canadians safe. Here, here. 
for Kilgilman St. Paul. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that violent gun crime has only gone up under this Prime Minister. Actually, it's gone up significantly since he's formed office, and the data proves this, Mr. Speaker. He has failed to keep Canadians safe from gun violence in our cities like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and at the same time, he's been weak on violent crime, soft on criminals by allowing them to avoid jail time with bills like Bill C-5. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister drop his failed approach, stop putting our communities at risk, and go after dangerous criminals with guns? Mr. Speaker, our criminal justice reform legislation turns the page on failed conservative policies that ignored systemic racism and discrimination. Put simply, these new rules will ensure that those people who aren't allowed or shouldn't have access to a gun can't get one and prevent guns from falling into the wrong hands. There are, all, there are handguns all over, they're all illegal, and they're in the hands of criminals. And that the people that legitimately own them, they're in safes and being taken to gun clubs. The two sections don't intersect. Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is misleading Canadians. Bill C-5 and the other measures by this Liberal government are failing to keep our communities safe. They are putting them at risk. If they wanted to stop gun violence, they'd put more resources to border agents to stop gun smuggling. Right. They'd put more resources to police to stop violent criminals with guns. They'd put more resources for anti-gang community groups to divert youth from a life of crime. That's how you stop gun violence, That's not right. useless gun bans or bills like Bill C-21 that will do nothing to stop it's gun violence violence in this country. Isn't that right, Mr. Speaker? Oh, that's right. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, over the past seven years, we've continually moved forward on strengthening gun control in this country. And that's exactly what we announced yesterday, uh, making it no longer legal, as of the passage of that legislation, to buy, sell, import or transfer fire, uh, handguns in Canada. On top of that, the, uh, the uh, assault weapon ban uh, that we brought in place two years ago is going to be matched with a mandatory buyback. These are measures that are going to keep our community safe measures the Conservatives vote against because they're against gun control. It is horrific what has occurred in our province today. A shocking crime in several small communities, 10 dead, at least 15 injured, found in 13 separate locations. Police say these two suspects, 31-year-old Damien Sanderson and 30-year-old Miles Sanderson, targeted some of their victims, others appeared to be attacked at random. members parrot talking points from the gun lobby, we will continue to act on keeping Canadians safe. That's exactly what we've continued to do over the past many years and what we continue to move forward with on st stronger gun control, while at the same time we do invest in communities, while we do invest in more tools for CBSA and RCMP to interdict guns at the border. Indeed, over the past year, we interdicted twice as many guns as we had the year before. Our plan is working, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to keep Canadians safe. Nicholson has been looking into that. So, Katie, can you take us through what exactly you're learning tonight? Right, so Adrian, what we received this evening were Miles Sanderson's parole documents, and they paint a disturbing picture of an explosively violent offender whose criminal record started young. The documents outline 20 years of violence, 59 convictions, assault, assault with a weapon, uttering threats, assaulting a police officer, robbery, and a long history of alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, it, it specifically mentions cocaine. And there is a disturbing history of intimate partner violence, something he himself was exposed to in childhood. Uh, but it also speaks to him or speaks of him as a perpetrator of intimate partner violence, forcing his way into his ex-girlfriend's home, punching a hole in the bathroom door, frightening the children who were hiding there. Uh, throwing a cement block at a woman's vehicle through the windshield, uh, kicking a police officer in the face, threatening to murder a band store employee. And in 2018, it details how he stabbed two men with a fork. Bill C-5 addresses systemic racism and discrimination through the elimination of some mandatory minimum penalties. 
Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we saw Liberals engage in a game of smoke and mirrors. On one hand, they're banning handguns. On the other hand, they're pushing through Bill C-5, which tells criminals, don't worry. If you're convicted of a gun crime, you just hang out at home for your sentence. This is not keeping communities safe, and it is not reassuring to moms and dads who are worried about their kids. So will the Prime Minister get serious about keeping vulnerable communities safe, scrap Bill C-5, and legislate tough penalties for gun criminals? Honourable Prime Minister. It's absolutely true that we move forward to present legislation that, once passed, will make it no longer legal to buy, sell, transfer, or import handguns anywhere in Canada. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, the Bill C-5, the legislation does not stop police from charging people with gun offences or prosecutors from pursuing convictions. What it does do is make sure criminals face serious penalties while addressing the over-representation of black Canadians and Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice of the opposition. And I know all of us want our kids safe in their schools and in their communities. That's why I'm so frustrated with what these Liberals are doing. They're banning guns, and then when the criminals ignore their gun ban and use the guns to rob someone or commit a carjacking, the Liberals are letting these gun criminals do their time at home. How can the Prime Minister claim to be keeping people safe when he refuses to have jail time for violent criminals who ignore his useless gun bans and are hurting and terrorizing our children. Now, even though while incarcerated, he didn't follow the rules, he was transferred to a minimum security healing lodge. And although rated as highly likely to reoffend, he was granted release with conditions like don't use alcohol, no drugs, uh, not to engage in intimate uh, relations with a woman without written consent, um, that he uh, needed to stay away from some people. We know he talked about gang involvement from the documents. And we know that in May, he was unlawfully at large and police were looking for him because evidently he couldn't stick with those conditions. But we promised to go even further to protect our communities. We proposed to invest to help provinces and territories put restrictions on handguns within their jurisdictions. I can tell you that the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police have indicated that that won't make any difference. When we seize handguns, the handguns are always almost 100% in the possession of people who have no legal right to possess them. They're almost always stolen or illegally obtained. I simply don't see as a 27-year veteran how adding another layer of law will make any difference anywhere in this country. When we stop somebody in this city and police do this every single day and they have a handgun, somehow saying that this jurisdiction, that Winnipeg is handgun free, and I'll use air quotes, is going to make it safer or easy for us is just nonsense. It won't make any difference whatsoever. However, in our discussions with law enforcement, advocates and experts, it became apparent that we needed a different solution. Uh, as Chief Firearms Officer, I have two main responsibilities. I have a mandate letter, which means that I run the uh, Canadian Firearms Program in Alberta as uh, it is currently structured, but I also have a mandate to advocate for change. And uh, that change should be in the direction of ensuring that uh, the law targets the people who are doing bad things and leaves uh, law-abiding firearms owners uh, to their uh, peaceful activities as much as possible. And so, uh, to that end... So we decided to take a new route, something that would tackle this issue at a national level. And so today, we're moving forward. We're introducing legislation to implement a national freeze on handgun ownership. What this means is that it will no longer be possible to buy, sell, transfer, or import handguns anywhere in Canada. There are, all, there are handguns all over, they're all illegal, and they're in the hands of criminals. And that the people that legitimately own them, they're in safes and being taken to gun clubs. The two sections don't intersect.
Okay. I'm announcing the implementation of new, sensible, and safer rules around the sale and transfer of firearms. First, effective May 18, individuals and businesses transferring or selling a non-restricted firearm will need to confirm the purchaser's identity and validate that they hold and are still eligible to hold an appropriate firearms license, validate the transferee's license information to the Registrar of Firearms to avoid fraud and confirm that the license has not been revoked or suspended, and obtain a reference number from the Registrar in order to proceed with the acquisition. And this all can be done easily and instantaneously through the Canadian Firearm Programs portable, Portal, which is available online 24-7. It's no different than, 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 than there being a stolen car in Winnipeg and somebody saying, you know, it should be illegal to bring stolen cars into Winnipeg. People are going to get their hands on handguns. We live next door to the largest gun market in the entire planet. If you want guns, you're going to be able to get handguns. And saying somehow that they shouldn't be legal, and, 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 the, and, the, and the discussions are, uh, from what I understand, that they should be illegal in certain jurisdictions. So I legally own a gun in, um, you know, Il Deschain, and it gets stolen, it gets brought into Winnipeg, the current laws deal with all of that very effectively. And having some jurisdictional law in a particular area, and, and I can tell you this in terms of all of my colleagues who own guns as part of our job as law enforcement and investigate gun issues every day, the people at the forefront of that just shrug their shoulders and go, I guess if it makes someone somewhere think that they're doing something, that's great, but that's not what's going to happen. It will not change one thing thing from a law enforcement standpoint anywhere. So I hope uh, Minister Mendocino will uh, respond favorably to uh, my requests. I have offered the full assistance of myself and my team to implement this uh, idea of, uh, of finding alternative ways of spending the money. I consult widely with law enforcement and other uh, resources within the province of Alberta and I can give him no shortage of alternative uses of the resources that would be much better uh, ways of spending billions of dollars of taxpayers precious hard-earned money. Thank you. That's one more life that's been snuffed out as a result of, of gun violence and it's for this reason that, that so many uh, within uh, the law enforcement community, within the police community, uh, within the victims communities have been calling for uh, gun law reform for so long. And Bill C-71 is a response to those calls. So if someone owns a gun legitimately and it's stolen and it's brought into Winnipeg, somebody's saying, well, it's illegal to have that gun in Winnipeg, is just another layer of and I guess it might make some people feel good, but it will not change the threat level one iota. Fear in here is that the first step towards registering your guns is, is just the first step towards taking away guns from everyone. That's never going to happen because here in Canada, we have a culture that has that has grown up with guns and it respects the need to, to go out into the wilderness and shoot things from time to time. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? These are bad people. We live in a time where the people who pretend to be the good people are the bad people. Mr. Trudeau chose today instead to spit in their face. I, I, I want to choose my words very carefully. I know words matter. Uh, the words that we speak here and in Parliament matter. What Mr. Trudeau approved himself today was to be a liar, was to be of the most cynical variety of politician saying whatever it takes to get elected, then once elected, seeking any excuse, however weak, however absent, to justify that lie to Canadians. He promised to be different. He promised not to conduct himself this way, but to conduct himself with honour and integrity. I'm not sure the Liberals understand what the word respect means. 
because to have made such a black and white promise and then to feel so casual and cynical in breaking that promise, it puts into question any commitment, any promise Mr. Trudeau makes or has made in the past. But a, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who participated and the millions of Canadians who voted for this Liberal Party, for this Prime Minister, who said he would be different. So let me end with this. The pretty face the whole world loves is not the leader many believe he is. He may have a famous last name, good looks and Canada's top job, but Justin Trudeau is a far cry from being a statesman. Trudeau's got nothing now. And what, what happens? What happens to someone who has no principles? What happens to someone who comes in preaching rainbows and diversity and all of that nonsense? When, when they have painted themselves into a corner. Because he did this to himself. It did not have to be this way.